Distinguished guests uh, from Turkish and uh, European business community, dear colleagues, on behalf of TUSIAT, I would like to welcome you to China in a Global Economic Order uh, webinar. It's a great pleasure uh, for us to co-host the second edition of this webinar with our valuable partner, BDI, German Federation of Industries. Success of the first edition encouraged us to reorganize it this year as significant developments occurred in our economies. Let me briefly introduce TUSIAD for those who are not familiar with us. TUSIAD is a voluntary, independent, non-governmental business organization, which plays a role uh, in the Turkish economy. Our members account for 85% of Turkey's trade volume, employ 50% of the private sector for workforce, and generate around 80% of Turkey's corporate tax revenue. We represent Turkish business community, not only in Turkey, but also around the world through our membership in Business Europe, Global Business Coalition, Business and Industry Advisory Committee of the OECD, Business Met, and last but not the least, BRICA, Belt and Road Industrial and Commercial Alliance. China has been among the prior uh, countries of TUSIAD for over 15 years. We coordinate our China-related activities through TUSIAD China and Shanghai Networks, which I'm gladly presiding. Our main aim is to contribute to intensify economic relations between Turkey and China and follow closely the developments in China, which transforms at an unprecedented pace. Dear friends, no need to say how important Chinese economy is for all of us. The global economy has been passing through challenging times. As the business world, we need to better understand what is going on around us and navigate uh, our companies in the rough seas. This is the point where the importance of the Chinese economy arises. Better understand the global economy means, among others, understanding the colossal and vibrant Chinese economy. China is one of the leading players in shaping the global economic order after more than four decades of economic reform and opening. However, China is still experiencing a deep and rapid transformation process in all spheres of the economy and social life. The Chinese government is implementing a comprehensive and an ambitious development agenda in the context of 14th five-year plan. According to this plan, China implements dual circulation strategy, focusing on the growth of domestic consumption and technological innovation to provide it is self-sufficiency in some areas of the economy. Considering their possible impact, these policies are closely followed by foreign business community. On the other hand, we all observe tensions in the global trade. We are always in favor of open and liberal markets. In that sense, we are in favor of promoting competition instead of destructive trade war between the leading players of the global economy, as the tension has the potential of spillovers effects on the other parts of the world. Despite all the decoupling rhetoric, we believe uh, that the convergence and cooperation points exceed the divergent points. We believe uh, the importance of maintaining cooperation and the positive agenda in the EU and China on global challenges or in areas of mutual interest, such as decarbonization and climate change, international standard setting, sustainable development, WTO reform, and the fight against COVID-19. Today, we will listen to the prominent experts and discuss different perspectives from the EU. Germany and Turkey 
on China's role in the global economic order, its economic policies, the opportunities and challenges it offers to the business world, as well as the prominent initiatives on connectivity by both China and EU G7 countries. We will try to explore the role of China in the global economic order, touch upon the EU's economic relations and disputes with China and analyze, analyze the economic consequences of the evolving global rivalry between the US and China for the European Union and the rest of the world. I sincerely thank everyone for participating and uh, leave the floor to Wolfgang Niedermann, member of the executive board of BDI. Mr. Niedermark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Kodulu. Um, same is true for BDI. Uh, I skipped um, the introduction of BDI, but of course we have a similar role to play as you just explained for Tusia. Uh, but let me stress that we are also a member of Business Europe and we define ourselves as a, a truly European partner. Um, and uh, all we are discussing today is also uh, not only between Turkey and Germany, it's a European question and as you rightly described, it's a global question. This new era we are seeing, and I'm quoting in a, in a special way um, the Chinese wording, new era is coming up. Um, you have described it, um, you, as you said, there are lots of tensions going on. Uh, you spoke about decoupling and yes, we cannot deny that we are in a new phase. And it's good that uh, TUSIAS and BDI take the effort to shed some light on these developments and to align how to deal with these tensions and the new developments. And uh, it's good that we have so many companies on board here today uh, participating in this seminar, uh, because um, the, the companies have to accept that they are part of this game and they are more or less politicized in a, in a way by these developments and they cannot shy away. Some people still might think that the business of business is business. But uh, that has never been really true, and uh, it's really coming to an end. Uh, political questions have to be on the agenda of uh, strategic um, considerations of our companies, and that's why we are doing these uh, seminars. And it's really good to have one panel on um, the the chances and the opportunities how to further cooperate with China, how we make it possible to still cooperate. Uh, it is totally clear that we want to be in uh, business with China. Uh, nobody wants to step out or drive decoupling to a stage where we cannot have uh, growth in our business relations with China. Um, but of course, there is a lot of competition also going on. And, and uh, against this background is uh, good to see that we have a special focus in today's seminar on the Global Gateway Program, um, which was launched by the European uh, Commission recently. And it's good that we see Romana Vlahutin, uh, the special envoy here today. Um, she has been involved in the connectivity uh, program um, um, the, the, during the recent years, but now we see a dramatic step up uh, of the European Union up to 300 billion to be spent on infrastructure uh, and other measures uh, all over the globe and mainly in our neighborhood and also in uh, Turkey, of course. Um, it is interesting to discuss what's in for us as a Turkish, European, German business community, what can be achieved here. And um, so that is, of course, also uh, in a way, part of the competition with China. Um, and we have talked about the cooperation, we have the competition uh, at this end on the third market. And, um, and of course, there might be also instances for confrontation. Uh, we know all about the upcoming tensions with Olympic Games. Uh, we know the human rights issues today the uh, summit for democracy starts where China is, uh, of course, 
uh, one of the targets. Uh, and, and there is confrontation still also going on and we cannot shy away to uh, also discuss these elements. Um, hopefully we find um, uh, more reason to cooperate. The big challenges are totally clear with uh, climate policy, health policy, overcoming COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and that's what we are striving for. Our concept uh, is called, we are looking for responsible coexistence uh, with China and others. And against this background, uh, we are happy to discuss with you, with our partners in Turkey and other partners, uh, how to go on with uh, our cooperation and relation with China. So I wish the seminar all the success and uh, fruitful discussions, and I'm looking forward to listening to part of it. Thank you so much um, to both of you, Koran and Wolfgang. Um, I'm Friedolin Struck, and I'm the moderator of um, the first session. Um, the first session is on China in the global economy, and it's a privilege and great pleasure um, to um, it, for the first time in my professional life, moderate an all-female panel and being the moderator um, uh, as, a, as a male person, um, this is really uh, an honor and a pleasure um, and it speaks for how modern TUSIAT and BDI are in terms of um, gender diversity of their speakers. Um, the speakers we have in this first session um, I would like to present to you. Um, first, we have Alicia Garcia Herrero. Um, she is a senior fellow, senior fellow um, at the European think tank Bruegel. Um, she is chief economist, Asia Pacific at the French investment bank Nataxis. Um, she is a research fellow at Madrid-based think tank Real Instituto El, El Caño. Um, she's adjunct professor at Hong Kong University, and she's, um, last not least, uh, I could go on mentioning a couple of other functions, but uh, the fifth point I selected um, uh, because it has quite some importance um, looking at the European relations to China. Um, she's member of the advisory board of the Berlin-based um, uh, Mercator Institute on China Studies, Merics. The second speaker we have is Eren Erench. She's Associate Professor for China Studies at the Xi'an Jiaotang Liverpool University. Um, for those, including myself, uh, before this seminar, I was not aware of this uh, uh, Sino-British University. Um, it's in, located in the province of Jiangsu, um, 70 kilometers um, uh, uh, west of uh, Shanghai. Um, it was founded 2006 um, and uh, um, Erin is, uh, is uh, teaching there in the Faculty of China Studies. She holds a PhD from Boston University among other degrees and other previous functions. Our third speaker is Françoise Huang. Um, she joined Euler Hermes in 2019 um, and uh, uh, works there as the senior economist for Asia Pacific. Euler Hermes, um, that's more familiar to me, um, is since 1996 a daughter company of the German large global insurance company Allianz. Euler Hermes is um, specialized in export credit insurance. And in the field of export credit insurance, it's um, the world market leader with a global share of the world market in export credit insurance of roughly 35%. In previous positions, Francoise um, was in the banking sector in London and Paris. And among these positions, um, she was in the French banking supervisory authority. We will jump right into the topic and my first question is directed um, to to Jeren um, because I would like to start with a quick overview um, on um, the Turkish-Chinese 
um, business development, um, how did trade, how did investment develop in the past years, um, and uh, we have already heard from Kohan um, that economic and business relations with China play a major important role um, for Turkish business. Um, could you give us some hints where you stand at the moment um, and what you see as latest developments, please? Thanks, Fedulin. Um, let me clarify one thing first uh, before going ahead. Um, unlike uh, my fellow panelists, uh, I'm not an economist by training. Uh, I'm a political scientist. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, my uh, two cents uh, to offer here uh, will be rather from a political economy perspective. Um, having, um, having said that, uh, let me uh, uh, give also a, a historical perspective, as you know, the political scientists tend to do. Um, so uh, you already mentioned uh, that uh, there are different dimensions uh, of uh, Turkey-China economic relations, right? Trade, investment, and I would add actually one more dimension: the financial uh, dimension. And uh, they all uh, coexist, of course. Uh, but uh, still, when I look at uh, the last, uh, let's say, twenty years, uh, twenty something. Years, years of uh, the most re recent relations, but actually uh, the Turkish state uh, decided uh, to prioritize its relations, uh, primarily economic, uh, uh, but also inevitably political relations with the Chinese state, instead of um, um, openly and fully uh, supporting uh, the Uyghur cause. Uh, so we can start, you know, uh, this uh, new era of uh, China-Turkey uh, economic relations uh, from, let's say, uh, light, uh, late 90s uh, onwards. Uh, up until today, right? So um, I see, actually, I identify uh, three phases um, in uh, in this like 20 something years uh, long relationship between uh, two countries. And uh, by these phases, um, I don't mean, of course, um, um, uh, what I mean is uh, the dominance of a certain uh, economic activity, while of course the others also coexist, but uh, there's a pattern there. And the pattern I see is that um, when the Turkish state decides uh, to engage uh, with, uh, with uh, China um, economically, uh, in the first uh, phase, uh, the relations are uh, primarily based on, uh, on trade, right? Um, and, um, and that uh, uh, trade uh, relationship is, um, is uh, inevitably um, uh, creating uh, a, um, a deficit uh, against uh, the, uh, the Turkish um, uh, business uh, cycles because of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the growth model, the growth and uh, development model uh, China pursues in the 80s and uh, up until 2000s, basically. Uh, the, um, um, uh, the, the low cost um, uh, and a, a lot of technology uh, 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 based uh, industry uh, led uh, growth. Um, so um, uh, back that uh, uh, back uh, back then uh, in the um, in the two thousands, Turkey was in a way uh, la already late to the game, right? Uh, China opened up in the eighties, and uh, all the foreign investments uh, uh, bought uh, uh, through uh, the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, overseas Chinese, uh, by the Chinese diaspora uh, from Southeast Asia and uh, from the uh, from the states uh, went in, and also um, European countries, primarily Germany. Uh, the German companies also uh, went in uh, to China uh, thanks to the uh, the support, the logistical uh, uh, support and training of uh, of the German state, right? So Germany stands as a you know uh, like a model almost uh, in this sense, um, uh, engaging with uh, the reform and opening up uh, China, reform era China. So uh, in uh, early two thousands, uh, the business cycles in Turkey um, were aware of the growing importance of China, uh, but lacked the resources to play a share in uh, investment. Uh, in the uh, highly competitive east coast of China. And the Turkish state uh, was not prepared to provide support uh, to private businesses in the way, as I said, the German state did uh, uh, 
earlier uh, in the uh, in the earlier decades. Um, again, consequently, uh, the trade deficits uh, grew at the expense of uh, Turkey over the years. So when we come to 2010s, uh, we see a shift uh, in uh, in the China strategy of of the Turkish uh, states uh, to a more investment led uh, fashion, um, and uh, realizing that only investments uh, could bridge the deficits uh, for for Turkey actually. Um, and um, uh, again, as I said, uh, for the lack of uh, the, um, um, uh, the, the, the state support uh, for, for the private businesses, uh, we don't see much uh, Turkish investment in China. Um, we see an increase in uh, Chinese investment in, uh, in Turkey uh, in different uh, industries. Um, but um, these investments in Turkey also do not uh, prove to be uh, profitable in the long term. Um, and I I think the, the energy sector, the energy and transportation sectors are like two uh, prominent cases uh, in point. And um, for example, if you talk about uh, the energy uh, sector, uh, we see that uh, Chinese investment in, um, in Turkish energy sector are mostly in outdated uh, coal technologies, um, uh, which uh, China itself has already committed to phase out of, right? Um, and uh, and uh, similarly, when we look at the transportation uh, investments, uh, we see some investment in, in railroads, but these are not uh, directly uh, connected to the BRI. In fact, um, I want to claim that uh, Turkey is uh, excluded from uh, the major BRI projects and routes in, uh, in, in, in its immediate region or uh, sub-regions, let's say. Um, Again, uh, uh, for example, uh, ports and uh, the renewable energy investments in Eastern Mediterranean as an emerging sub-region um, is a case in point here uh, that uh, uh, Turkey um, uh, lost uh, its bids uh, for, uh, for hosting the important uh, uh, ports in the East Mediterranean region uh, within the BRI uh, yeah, yeah, BRI scheme, and um, and it's also um, very late uh, to uh, the renewable energy investments, uh, considering that uh, the uh, Gulf countries and uh, and Egypt are already for about ten years. Um, uh, being the, the hubs of uh, China's uh, green BRI in the region, in the Eastern Mediterranean MENA region. And uh, now uh, we see an increase in uh, China funded uh, renewable energies in Turkey, but again, uh, almost uh, a decade uh, later than uh, the, the neighboring countries in the region. And um, even uh, Kumport, the only uh, China-owned, uh, 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 Chinese-owned um, uh, port uh, in Turkey, um, uh, is not uh, efficient as efficient as it's supposed to be. Let's say um, due to uh, the uh, the logistical issues uh, between um, uh, between uh, two countries uh, or between Turkey and uh, and uh, whoever wants to use the port actually and um, uh, uh, there's also uh, the um, the middle corridor, um, uh, a very prominent example, um, I think, um, uh, it was, uh, well, it has been, I, I should say, I guess, um, uh, the Turkish uh, state's um, project since uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and uh, the emergence of Central, Central Asian republics to link Asia uh, through uh, railroads and, uh, and, and highways um, and make uh, to make uh, Turkey a logistical and transportation hub between Asia and, and Europe. Um, well, that hasn't happened uh, before BRI uh, uh, due to uh, several political financial reasons. And then um, uh, Turkey intended to have the middle corridor uh, to be incorporated into the BRI, uh, yet, that hasn't happened uh, yet uh, either. Um, so overall, so these examples uh, show us that um, the, the second phase of uh, Turkey-China economic relations that are uh, that is marked with uh, investment uh, decisions or intentions, uh, for that matter, um, also hasn't come to a flirtation. So um, while, of course, uh, these uh, attempts uh, to, uh, to engage uh, with uh, the Chinese uh, SOEs um, 
and the Chinese state uh, in, in general uh, uh, through uh, investment, especially in the in the emerging uh, sectors uh, like uh, renewable energies is still going on. Um, I uh, identify yet a third phase uh, in which um, um, the China-Turkey economic relations are getting financialized, uh, meaning that um, lately we see um, uh, an increase in the financial lendings or, uh, from Chinese banks uh, to, to Turkey. And uh, the interesting thing is that most of these loans are uh, in the category of um, uh, OOF, the, or the other official funds, not the developmental aid. Um, and these are uh, deposited into uh, the sovereign uh, fund in Turkey, which is under the control of the presidential bureaucracy. Um, so it means that uh, these funds are not uh, financial aids uh, for specific developmental purposes, uh, such as uh, the BRI projects, uh, but their overall financial support uh, for the, the ailing economy of, um, of Turkey, such as in the form of like, export credits um, and refinancing loans and whatnot. So um, in short, um, that's, uh, that financial relationship uh, creates um, a, a financial dependency without uh, long-term economic returns for Turkey. And um, I Thank think uh, this is the, the stage uh, that uh, we are in. And with that, um, I, I'm going to stop. And if you have more questions, I can continue later. Super, thank you for an excellent uh, starting point uh, with this analysis. Um, Alicia, I would like to turn to you. Um, and uh, just if, if we look at this picture um, 10, 15 years ago, um, uh, high promises on what could be developed between Turkey and China. Um, do you see um, an, a danger um, that the Chinese economy um, could run into a middle income trap. Um, do you see um, the um, what we what we see um, as uh, um, as not fulfilled promises with Chinese investment in Turkey, but also in many other countries in Eastern Europe? Um, uh, do we see um, a, a trend that? the Chinese economy is running out of steam um, or will China continue to grow at a level of 6% or around 6%, which is remarkable for an economy of that size? What is your impression? Well, thanks very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the question. It's actually the key question because we economists tend to uh, always draw, you know, lines um, in a way, draw conclusions from the past, which is good, but, you know, it's very hard to know what the future may, may uh, expect for us. And in that regard, um, let me give you a, a few numbers as to the countries that have actually surpassed uh, or bypassed the middle income trap. Um, and the best example is actually South Korea. So South Korea, after reaching $10,000 per capita, uh, um, grew an average of 5.5% in the 10 years after. So in other words, even 6% would be extreme, meaning nobody's expecting China, or at least not me. And I don't think even, frankly, the party, because Li Keqiang just announced in the Politburo that he was expecting 5 to 5.5% in 2022. So the good news here is that China has realized that, that um, it can't, but it also shouldn't grow at 6% a year for 10 years, because that would be even outpacing the most successful case of a country surpassing the middle income trap, which is South Korea. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we need to lower our expectations, which is not bad for China, it's not bad for the rest of the world. Actually, a too rapid growth would only increase the humongous, I have to say, imbalances that China already has today. And the best example is the real estate sector. So in that regard, that's good news. Now, can China actually grow 5.5% as South Korea did? And to me, the answer is unfortunately no. China can't grow 5.5% in the next 10 years. Um, 
I don't think that should surprise anybody because this is not me telling you, it's the NDRC telling everybody. And this is simply because of what I would argue could be actually characterized by the law of gravity, meaning a country, not so much of the size of China, because it's not about size. India has the same size and actually potential growth is indeed about 5.5%, but simply because it's at, it, it is at a different level of development. It still has much higher population growth. Urbanization is at its starting point or at least not as, deep, as advanced as China. What China is facing is not only a much more elderly uh, population and of course um, depopulation, but also, and most importantly, a fast decreasing labor productivity. And that's the key. Total factor productivity in China is stagnant, notwithstanding the massive um, um, push for re research and development. And this is not because China is not innovative. I'm sure China is very innovative. It's that it is very hard for a country of the size of China and with such an unequal and diversified landscape to put so much on the table to be able to grow only out of innovation. All of the other factors, whether it's labor productivity, whether it's fixed asset investment, which is at its peak, whether it's the return on assets, whether it's depopulation, all push southwards. So this means that China by 2030, i.e. in eight years, uh, nine years, will grow around 2.4%. So is that enough for Turkey? Maybe yes. I mean, at the end of the day, by then China will be the largest economy in the world. And the more China opens up to the world, and I would argue not only trade-wise, but also um, financially, the more flows there may be into Turkey, the more funding opportunities. So I'm not saying that this is not enough. That's not the judgment. It's more about will China escape the middle income trap, which was your question. <laughs> and the answer is not by 2030, because by then China will have a, you know, probably 15, 15 US dollar per capita. That's not South Korea. I've not even mentioned uh, the fact that China is indeed um, tackling um, and living with a much more assertive, uh, and hostile environment that South Korea did live with the, during the 10 years after it reached $10,000 per capita. So in other words, it's actually even harder on the, on, on the side of, of the external environment. Um, so so in, in other words, I don't want this to be taken as bad news, but just maybe a realization of where China is heading. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very clear picture and uh, lowering our expectations when we look at the past um, uh, and knowing what might come in the future. Francois, uh, first, thank you for joining us in this uh, uh, TUSIAT BDE semi BDI seminar. Um, uh, we will stay for a moment um, at the uh, perspectives of uh, the Chinese economy. Um, what is your assessment? What do you expect um, from the Chinese economy in terms of growth, um, in terms of overall development? Um, we have seen um, in 2020 and also in 2021 um, that China definitely can be considered as one of the winners um, of uh, coping with the COVID pandemic. Um, and uh, how do you see um, the shape of uh, the Chinese economy at the moment? Thank you. Thank you for your question and, and thank you for having me on this uh, panel. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, I think you, you, yeah, you said uh, China was considered as a, as a winner of the, out of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I would say that a year ago, probably we, would, we wouldn't surprise anyone by, by saying that. And it was definitely one of the conclusions that uh, our, our analysis was, was bringing us and more precisely in terms of long-term path. 
Uh, a year ago, we were expecting that uh, China would catch up with uh, the US in terms of GDP by 2030. And, and that's even two years earlier than what we were expecting before the COVID-19 crisis. So from this respect and, and, and in, in, yeah, from in this perspective, it, it was relatively easy to say that, uh, yes, China was a relative winner. And, and I think it's important to say relative because nobody is a winner in a global pandemic. But yeah, China was a relative uh, winner uh, out, of the, out of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, a year later, we could say maybe that uh, this, I think this conclusion still holds, but uncertainties uh, seem, to, seem to, be, to, to be increasing. Uh, of course, uh, I'm sure everybody uh, follow the news and, and see that China is ongoing uh, an economic slowdown. Uh, it's in the middle of, of this year, we've seen more and more concerns, um, especially in terms of regulation and in terms of the impact on the real estate sector, uh, energy crunch, etc. So China is ongoing uh, an economic slowdown. Um, of course, it raises a bit of uncertainties, but for me, we need to understand uh, how this uh, economic slowdown came about to understand how really how worried we should be. And, and our understanding is that this, this slowdown is partly self-inflicted. So as you mentioned, uh, 2020 uh, was a really good year for China because the economic recovery was faster than uh, most most other large economies uh, of the world. And on this strong basis, uh, Chinese policymakers decided to uh, turn more towards long-term targets and less so uh, short-term support for, for, for the economy. Because the 2020 strong recovery, the 2020 fast recovery uh, was engineered uh, thanks to swift policy support with fiscal easing that supported infrastructure spending and with monetary easing that uh, supported the, the real estate sector. So going into 2021, Chinese authorities switched their focus and decided that we need to kind of um, leave these short-term patches to, to, to cater to the long-term vulnerabilities. And one of them being uh, the huge amount of debt uh, and the financial risks that, that are of course are brought on with this, uh, with this debt, debt pile. So that's uh, implied uh, macroprudential rules, that implied uh, regulation uh, that, uh, with one of the big uh, implications being being the, the concerns, the liquidity issues and the, and the slowdown we're seeing in the real estate sector. So apart from, of course, the COVID-19 outbreaks, these downside risks that were more difficult to, 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 to expect, the ongoing Chinese economic slowdown is actually, uh, a lot, for a large part, self-inflicted, if I, if I dare say, uh, or, or uh, we, we could say policy-driven. And uh, it is policy driven because China is trying to cater to the, to the, to the long-term objectives. China is trying to mend, let's say, the structural vulnerabilities in order to uh, have a soft landing in the, in the long term and in order to, to, um, to, to get to these uh, growth rates that are still solid. The, for example, Alicia mentioned, I think 2% uh, or between 2 and 3% by 2030, so still solid, but uh, China needs to mend some structural vulnerabilities before, before getting there. And uh, I think one thing also we should note is that, uh, so I said China put in place swift policy reaction to react, um, sorry, swift policy support to react to the, to the large crisis led on by, by COVID-19 crisis. This is also true uh, in other main economies in the world. So uh, the result for China, if we just look at uh, simple numbers, is that the debt to GDP ratio of the overall economy increased by nearly 30 uh, percentage points over a year, which is of course uh, very large and it brings China's total debt to nearly 300% of GDP. But these kind of considerations is also true in other uh, any other, uh, economy any other economy that put in place strong state support, strong state guarantees for companies uh, in, in the face of, uh, of COVID-19 crisis. And, and that is the case also in advanced economies, of course. Uh, and over here at, at, at Cuba Hermes, you mentioned, we're the leader in, 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 uh, in trade credit. So we look at insolvencies number very closely. And as state support and state guarantees are, are being removed, we do expect insolvencies to, to creep up and increase again in the, in, in the coming year or coming few years. So all economies in the world will have to deal with the post-COVID uh, legacies and, and some maybe post-COVID-19 uh, uh, scarring. And it would seem that China has started to do that already, already this year, which means that there is some short-term impact, short-term pain on the, on, the, on the economy. 
But the bigger picture is that what is happening at the moment is to lay, uh, let's say, a healthier basis for uh, long-term long -term growth. So um, overall, I would say maybe the path in the short to medium term is a bit more uncertain because authorities and, and regulators are doing some hard work to, to try to, to, to remove some, some financial risks. Uh, so of course, that could, could can create some volatility in the short to medium term and, and can create some uncertainties. Uh, but for me, the big, bigger picture is that uh, this is done so that we have a better and more sustainable uh, long-term growth path uh, for, for China. Thank you, Françoise, um, for this uh, brilliant insight um, on the uh, Chinese economy. Um, uh, I would like to stay a moment um, at the political risks and uh, um, before I enter into the second round of questions. Um, I invite all the participants um, uh, in the Q&A function. I have seen that there is already one first question. Um, after this next round, um, uh, we, we do the discussion. Um, I'll open it up to the floor and I will, I will try to read some of the questions that are mentioned in the Q&A. So please, I invite you, um, if you're interested in specific questions, please take your time to type them in the Q&A and I will uh, look at it um, while this discussion is ongoing. We have um, another um, more than 20 minutes to continue. Um, the second round, Alicia, I would like uh, to start with you. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, I would like to look into political risks. And the first and basic political risk is um, for our companies, they are looking at trends of decoupling. They are looking at trends um, that China um, is looking for um, a techn technological uh, self-sufficiency to a higher degree. Um, we see um, a tech decoupling um, that is driven by the rivalry between the US and China. Um, how, how do you see the business impact of uh, decoupling trends um, that are pushed both in Washington and Beijing, and probably um, also pushed um, by Europe um, when we uh, when we look at how we debate on China um, uh, as a systemic rival um, to us in uh, in international competition. Please. Well, thanks for the question. Um, when we think about the coupling, we tend to think about uh, politicians. Uh, uh, pushing for decoupling and, and, and companies avoiding, uh, trying to avoid the impact of that decoupling. I happened to have uh, um, an event yesterday in which Eric Schmitz from ex uh, Google CEO was participating. And he's a very good example of somebody who is calling for bifurcation. Some companies simply realize that uh, we've come to a point where bifurcation might be a better option for some companies. I'm not saying that. that so, so the first thing I'd like to say is that it's, it's not necessarily clear whether companies will continue to support uh, open markets. Why is this the case? There's two reasons in my view. Uh, one reason is third markets. So companies may perhaps uh, come to the realization that they're losing more in third markets than what they're gaining in China. Why? Because of course, forced technological transfer, data requirements, you name it. So in other words, because of the conditions required to operate in China, companies might end up thinking, well, you know, I, I better uh, compete with all of my instruments in third markets rather than lose those third markets. That's one. The other one is that, companies may actually um, forget about the third markets, may actually fear um, the conditions for themselves. And this could be, you know, say AI. And this was the, 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 the point uh, raised by Eric uh, Schmidt yesterday, which is, does, do I need to comply with different criteria uh, tech-wise? Um, in China, as opposed to my own home cart market, that makes it too expensive uh, to operate in both ecosystems. And uh, the example of, uh, of course, um, AI is clear because we may end up very, very easily 
with a number of regulations uh, for good AI as opposed to a different AI, making it very expensive for companies to operate otherwise. It, and, and then on top of everything I said, there is the, politi the politicians and the fact that we may have sanctions, say just the example of cotton and how you know textile companies may be uh, kind of struggling uh, to, to operate with such sanctions. So I started with the companies because I thought that's the hardest to understand in a way. I mean, the, the, when it's imposed upon us, it's kind of, you don't have a, a chance or it, it, it seems that you don't have a, a freedom of action, but sometimes it might actually start from the companies. So all in all, I, I, I would argue that um, what I think the future will bring us is selective decoupling. In other words, there will be instances in which companies may accommodate uh, decoupling because it pays off in a way, or, or, all, or maybe it's not the first best, but it's the second best, yeah? Mm -hmm. And in other instances, the cost of decoupling will be so huge that companies will decide to still, no matter the difficulties, uh, politically driven to go ahead. Uh, and, and I guess that's why we won't have a single um, action for every company whatsoever. Yeah. Francoise, would you like to jump in? Um, what do you see um, uh, when you talk to companies um, on uh, credit insurance? Um, uh, what do you think what the strategies of companies will be. Um, do we see more diversification? Um, do we so see um, a partial or a selected, as Alicia puts it, a partial decoupling um, of uh, business within um, the value chain um, of individual companies? Yeah, thank you for, for the question. Um, regarding the first part of your, your question, what do we see with companies we, we talk to? Uh, honestly, there is still very strong appetite for, for, for doing business in or with China. So I think uh, uh, many, many companies, of course, still see the, 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 the benefits from, from doing a business with uh, such a big and, and growing market. Uh, so I think that's something that uh, is, uh, is, uh, is unlikely to, to change in the, in, the, in the medium term. In terms of uh, diversification, I think there were, uh, I would say it's not only related to political risks. I would say if you look at, uh, you know, surveys that were carried out by chambers of commerce in, in, in China, so uh, with, with uh, foreign businesses, whether it's European or, or American, what we, would, we could see already before COVID or, or, or before even the US-China trade tensions is that maybe the, the intentions of investment were not as strong as the early 2010s or, or, the, or, the, 2000, or, or the 2000 years. Uh, so the intentions of foreign investment into China were not as strong. And I think back then it was more some economic rationales because uh, as we mentioned in the first round of questions, uh, China is kind of navigating a change of rhythm in its uh, economic growth, a um, uh, kind of normalization towards lower levels of, of, of growth. So China is going through this long-term uh, change. And of course, we see rising costs uh, in, in China, whether, whether it's labor costs or, or, or more recently environmental costs. So, so these economic reasons, uh, let's say, were, were already existing pre-COVID and, and pre-geopolitical risks. Uh, that we see, of course, flaring up in the in the in the past few years, uh, and I would say that there were already these uh, pre-existing um, uh, bases that uh, were uh, making companies already move away. Some companies, some sectors, uh, move away for China to look for uh, cheaper uh, cheaper costs for for production, of course. And and I think Alicia mentioned, for example, textile. This is something, of course, that we've seen. Uh, already companies moving away from 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 China to to um, less costly uh, countries in in the region. So I think we we have already this kind of uh, of trends happening when we look at uh, foreign businesses relationship with, with China. Uh, and then I think uh, something also to keep in mind is the regulatory environment within China, uh, which has been a big theme uh, this year and which has uh, made a lot of noise. Uh, from our perspective, I think one thing, one important thing to, to, to say is that this regulatory crackdown 
is not a sign that China is becoming anti-business or, or, or anti-foreign foreign businesses. Um, we say regulatory crackdown because that's what we see in terms of short-term impact. Uh, but the rationale between uh, be, be behind the, the, the increased regulation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is because China has these long-term objectives uh, for, for the economy, uh, this uh, long-term long structure or, the, or that, that they, the authorities would want to see the Chinese economy achieve in order to, uh, to maintain a, a certain level of uh, minimum uh, growth, uh, let's say. So when, we, when businesses navigate this regulatory um, context, I think there's probably some sector differentiation to, to make. Uh, Chinese authorities will probably favor more uh, hard technology than, than software or, or soft technology. Uh, and, and very consumer driven uh, apps or, or, or yeah, soft technologies. China will for sure also uh, favor investment uh, and, and the regulatory environment will uh, most definitely be favorable for any technologies and sectors that are related to green transitions. So maybe more than ever and more than, than before, uh, uh, foreign businesses doing, going into China will have to be aware of this uh, regulatory environment. Uh, but yeah, China is not turning anti-foreign business, I would say. This year, again, the negative list for foreign investment uh, was reduced. Uh, and, and maybe the last risk uh, that, of course, uh, the, the elephant in the room that needs to be watched is the US-China relationships. For us, uh, in, the, in, the, in the short term, at least, uh, so of course, the environment is not as favorable as the, as the 2000 or early 2010s. But uh, for us, we are at a stage where economies are still coupled enough uh, so that any harsher actions such as tariff hikes uh, or harsh regulation that would really make uh, the life of businesses difficult between the US and China, these are unlikely to happen in the, in the short term. Thank you so much. Um, Cheren, um, in, um, in many of the capitals in Brussels, in Washington, um, China um, and the Chinese system is very much criticized um, for, uh, for, among many points, um, for a far too big influence of the party and of the state um, in business in general. We have too many SOEs um, and uh, we have a lot of negative influence um, of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises and public subsidies into international business. Um, nevertheless, um, the Chinese model in many countries is seen as an attractive model uh, because its performance is quite well um, and its performance um, can definitely at the moment can compete um, with the performance of democracies and market economies. How is this discussion on the role model of China. How is this debated in Turkey? Um, I'm quite sure that my question is not so interesting for our Turkish participants, but for the Western European participants, um, I would be very interested to, to get some hints from your side. Thank you. Uh, it is actually quite a timely question, um, considering that uh, the presidential bureaucracy uh, uh, is suggesting uh, the Chinese model, uh, the so-called Chinese model, which I think uh, they, uh, with which they refer to uh, the 80s uh, China, actually, um, as a quick fix out of the uh, the current currency crisis uh, that uh, Turkey is going through uh, lately. Um, so yeah, that's <laughs> a spot on question. Um, I guess I had like a one uh, immediate and uh, one long term um, answer uh, to your question, like a broader, uh, an answer from a broader perspective. I mean, so like a, a more immediate uh, answer is um, so uh, the suggestion that uh, uh, Turkey can emulate uh, the Chinese, the so-called Chinese model is uh, the idea behind that is Turkey can benefit from uh, foreign investment in uh, labor intensive law technology industries, especially because of uh, its geographical uh, proximity to the developed markets. 
uh, meaning uh, the European uh, markets. Um, so like tapping into what Francois was talking about uh, a minute ago, but like uh, the, uh, the manufacturing uh, industry uh, uh, phasing out of uh, China. So uh, that's an idea that was discussed um, first uh, during the pandemic, actually, when the transportation routes were temporarily blocked. Um, uh, even some among uh, the business elite in Turkey suggested that Turkey might actually uh, appear as, uh, as an alternative uh, to China. Uh, by emulating uh, 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 China. Um, but again, um, this is um, the, the China model here uh, refers to, um, again, you know, uh, the early stages of, of the reform era. So when we, uh, what we identify as uh, the China model, if there's one, um, today, uh, as you said, as you described, and, like, and, and the, the fellow panelists, um, of course, uh, discussed, uh, the uh, the state led SOE heavy um, macro industrial uh, planning, um, right? Uh, and uh, the state steering of, uh, of the, of the uh, especially the emerging uh, industries uh, like AI um, and, and whatnot, right? So um, I don't uh, see uh, an, um, an intention um, or the capacity for that matter to emulate uh, this, uh, this current uh, Chinese model. Um, what is being discussed in Turkey as, uh, the, as the, is the China model is again, as I said, very much uh, manufacturing industry and, and trade uh, oriented one. And uh, one, um, uh, like interesting uh, uh, concurrent development with this uh, this so-called China model debate is the, uh, the the reheating of the debate around uh, the middle corridor. Uh, first, uh, with the the uh, the uh, uh, war on a uh, war of uh, the Karabakh war, um, and uh, more recently the. Um, uh, the organization of uh, Turkic states, uh, as Kuo means, I think uh, last month, like uh, about 15 days ago. Um, so it is, uh, it seems to be uh, an all parts of a strategy uh, uh, to uh, pull the transportation routes uh, down from the Northern corridor of the BRI and like revitalize uh, the, the middle corridor. But again, uh, for, um, uh, for uh, manufacturing industry uh, slash uh, trade uh, purposes. Um, so that's like what's currently uh, going on um, in, uh, in Turkey. And if I uh, take a, uh, a broader perspective um, on that, um, Turkey has had uh, multiple initiatives um, uh, such as uh, like the, the shift of access um, or um, the, uh, the, again, so-called Asian turn with uh, the, um, uh, the application for a full membership to Sh Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Or more recently, the foreign, uh, foreign department has a, uh, like a new policy of Asia in you. Um, uh, so these are like on and off uh, in the uh, for the last twenty years uh, basically. Um, but these uh, uh, Asia pivots of uh, Turkey uh, remain as a foreign policy rhetoric. Um, of a foreign policy initiative in terms of engagement with regional organizations and uh, regional actors, um, uh, rather than a state-led industrial policy. Um, so, um, um, so uh, it, 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 economically speaking, it includes um, uh, this, uh, securing a capital circulation um, uh, for Turkey, um, but um, it's not like, emulating uh, China's central government's uh, steered uh, macro level industrial uh, policies uh, for long term planning that uh, my fellow panelists have been uh, discussing here. Um, so, in, in short, my answer to your question is we cannot really talk about a model emulation. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I would like to pick up one question from the chat um, from Bulu Chahan. Um, the question, and uh, I'm not sure whether one of you wants to jump in on this question. Um, could um, carbon border adjustment measures be a possible trade restriction? Um, not only um, for trade between the EU and China, uh, but also for other regions. I like to, to respond. Uh, yes, I don't think the CBAM, so the carbon border adjustment mechanism, is a trade restriction. Uh, what it does is to just uh, equalize 
uh, the price of carbon across borders. Uh, so, so it seems to me that it makes a lot of sense uh, for European, uh, for the European single market to ensure that carbon is cost basically the same, whether it's produced locally or produced overseas. Um, so first of all, I, again, it's not a restriction. And I think uh, that eventually my, my sense is that the WTO will eventually take this on board because it, it has to be part of the solution for to, to address climate change. But will it be uh, an area of concern uh, in terms of EU-China um, economic relations? Indeed, because, um, and rightly so, because it's a question of level of development, China is, of course, behind Europe in terms of, the, uh, of carbon pricing, although it has created its own ETS, but the price is still very low and only covers electricity. So it's just not comparable. Um, and of course, China will want to, to gain time before it before its exports um, are taxed in, in Europe. So, so it's, it's, it's a, put it this way, it's a competitiveness issue, but it's not a trade barrier. That would be my answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, Can I, I ask a question have... uh, to Alicia? I'm sorry, uh, Fredolin, for interrupting. Um, on that, uh, we have two on that... minutes left. Um, okay, um, then um, I, I can ask, like, I guess, uh, offline, uh, if you want to go ahead with the question. That's okay, fine. Um, yes, uh, I, I would like to do a last very quick round, um, because I would be eager um, uh, to, um, to fulfill the prejudice that Germans are always punctual and in time. Um, uh, if you allow me a one sentence uh, closing from each of you, um, yesterday, the new German government started um, its job in Berlin. Um, if you would have one wish, what Germany should influence in terms of um, German, European, um, China policy, what would be your one wish to the German government? And I, we start in reverse order um, as we uh, as we started the first round and Francoise, um, we will start with you if you like. So the one wish uh, in terms of basically foreign policy with China yeah, from German and EU perspective, that's your, that's your question. Yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, I would say probably find a way for the EU to be more, uh, uh, vocal uh, or, or let's say more active in 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 shaping the the global stage and not not that we end up with just the us china uh, duopole uh, international stage and, and yeah finding a way for for the eu to be to be more vocal uh, and and i like that answer in a, in an <laughs> yeah thank you alicia would you like to continue with a one sentence um I, I like uh, Germany to push for a more integrated Europe uh, and a real uh, single market because I like to remind Germans um, as European that as much as Germany has benefited from China, it has benefited so much more from the single market and, and it, that ma market is still fragmented. So finalizing it uh, would in itself be um, not only good for Germany and Europe, but also good for EU-China relations because it would balance the relation. That's all. Thank you. Super. Jared. Um, I guess I would like uh, the German government to uh, to work towards um, EU-China engagements, uh, even if um, not at the high politics uh, level, but at least uh, at the societal uh, level. Um, uh, we observe uh, uh, these engagements uh, with, um, with Chinese, uh, let's say, scholars, uh, for example, or civil society representatives as a reflection of um, high politics. So I would encourage the German government uh, to actually continue engagements uh, with uh, Chinese uh, non-state actors. Thank you very much. Um, with this, I thank you, um, the three panelists of this first round. Um, and uh, 
Um, I will not draw a conclusion from this panel right now because I have the privilege of speaking in the end of our seminar. Um, I just wanted to mention that I have seen in the in the Q and A um, a couple of remarks, and most of the remarks were directed um, to issues of decoupling um, and reorganizing value chains, and indeed. Um, my colleague from the German Electronics Association, Michael Angerbauer, he correctly mentions that from the industry perspective, we do not talk about decoupling when we talk about China. Um, it's rather um, a rerouting um, of value chains. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, one of the very strong elements in all of your statements was um, that China continues to be an important market, a dynamic market, and an important place for European, um, uh, German, Turkish business to be. Um, with this um, uh, quick round, um, I would like to hand over to Altai Atli, um, to my dear colleague who is moderating the second session. Um, thank you so much, and please, Altai. Thank you very much, Fridolin. Thank you. And uh, this has been really an insightful, very to the point uh, panel. Uh, so thank you very much to you, to Geran, to Francoise, to Alicia. Now we'll take it from there. We'll take uh, it now to the, uh, to the uh, to connectivity, which is a major keyword, which is the keyword, if you ask me, for the post pandemic era of the global economy. So, well, for short, to be honest, uh, a less connected world, if you ask me, would have been uh, would not have suffered this much from the pandemic uh, if it if we weren't that much connected. But then again, this is an irreversible pro uh, uh, process. Connectivity, it's vital connectivity in every sense. Like I'm not only talking about physical infrastructure, but digital infrastructure, people to people connectivity. All of them are like vital conditions uh, for the recovery of the global economy for longer term uh, you know, sustainable development in Turkey, in China, in Europe, uh, anywhere in the world. So we'll be focusing with my uh, distinguished panelists, we'll be focusing on uh, connectivity and uh, uh, Jeran, Francois and Alicia and Fridolin, you have touched upon the Belt and Road Initiative, China's BRI uh, initiative. And of course, this has been on the news for like almost eight years now, since 2013. Uh, there have been a lot of hype. There have been a lot of concrete results. There have been a lot of questions and uncertainties uh, as well. But this is an ongoing project uh, that we see around the world. But recently, uh, there have been uh, some alternatives coming up. Like, for example, we'll be talking about the Global Gateway, uh, which is launched by the European Commission as I'm quoting the new European strategy to boost smart, clean, and secure links in digital energy and transport and strengthen health, education, and resource systems across the world. Very assertive uh, and uh, 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 you know, globally reaching uh, initiative. Before that, the G7 uh, countries had agreed to launch a, a bold new global infrastructure initiative under the title Build Back Better World, B3W, as again, I'm quoting a values driven, high standards uh, and transparent infrastructure part, uh, partnership led by major democracies to help narrow the 40, 000, uh, 40 trillion infrastructure need in the developing world. So, uh, well, uh, we are still going through the pandemics. Uh, the world will have to, uh, you know, recover from the effects uh, of the pandemic economically and in, in every sense. And I think these initiatives uh, will be playing an important role. But of course, uh, Global Gateway and Build Back Better World are very new. We are yet to see uh, what they are going to offer in concrete terms. And here we are to discuss actually what, to ex what uh, we can expect. So I'll be doing so with my three distinguished panelists. And uh, let me briefly introduce uh, them uh, to you. We have Dr. Tolga Bilenar. Uh, an assistant professor at Galsa University, the Department of International Relations, and he is also the vice chair uh, of the department. Then we have uh, Dr. Angela Stanzel, uh, who is an Asia associate at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, uh, which is the German international, 
Joint Institute for International and Security Affairs. And last but not least, we have Ambassador Romana Vlahutin, who is the Special Envoy for Connectivity at the European External Action Service. So let us start. Uh, let us use our time uh, efficiently, just like you did, Kridolin. Um, and OK, I'll be starting with actually Dr. Tolga Bilener. Uh, so in this, uh, as, uh, Tolga, as the only male speaker in this whole uh, webinar, uh, I'll be doing some positive discrimination. And I'll start with you. So uh, let's start from Turkey, because, you know, but, when we talk about connectivity in Turkey, we have grown up. I mean, you did, I did. Uh, we did grow up uh, with being told that our country is a bridge between continents, between Asia and between uh, between Asia and Europe, between East and the West. And now, uh, when we look at the recent developments in terms of connectivity projects, especially the Belt and Road Initiative, how do you think does the Belt and Road Initiative contribute uh, to this position of ours in Turkey in concrete terms, in terms of, you know, turning this bridge from rhetoric to reality, to concrete reality. Do you see a significant role of the Belt and Road Initiative in this respect, Olga? Thank you, Alta uh, It's a pleasure to be on this panel. So greetings to all participants from the European side of Istanbul. Yes, we use this metaphor frequently. Turkey is a bridge. We've heard that so many times. I'm not sure if it's always a good thing to be a bridge because usually others cross the bridge and the bridge doesn't benefit from it. Uh, Turkey would like, however, to benefit economically and diplomatically by connecting uh, the West and the East. It is, of course, Asia Minor's historical function. As far as Belt and Road Initiative is concerned, since day one, uh, you know very well that Turkey has expressed many times uh, since uh, 2013 that uh, when China first proposed the debris, the that it believes this enormous and ambitious project may offer an opportunity to support connectivity between countries, regions, markets, and mobilize uh, new resources. Uh, bes besides, it was in 2013, uh, the year the political relations between Turkey and the West uh, began to deteriorate. So Turkey was eager to develop ties with China. We also remember that in 2017, President Erdogan was present uh, in the Bree summit in, uh, held in Beijing. Turkey was enthusiastic to join in and especially to connect uh, its middle corridor plan to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Bree is, of course, not only an economic or commercial project, it has many aspects, including uh, geopolitical ones. And the Chinese officials, too, have expressed uh, many times that Turkey may play a crucial role in connecting uh, the European markets to China. Uh, let's remind that Ankara and China uh, signed a memorandum in 2015 uh, to align uh, the Middle Corridor Plan, uh, linking Europe and China via Turkey through the uh, Trans-Caspian uh, Transport Route in order to boost uh, trade and economic relations between partner uh, nations. Turkey's Middle Corridor and China's BRI uh, are two grand schemes that aims uh, transcontinental integration. Um, and the middle corridor is uh, essentially based on the idea of establishing a region-wide railroad uh, network. The most notable part uh, for now is the 840 kilometer long uh, Baku-Tbilisi cars uh, railroad completed in 2017. Um, in November 2019, a train uh, for China to Europe uh, passed through Turkey, and in December 2020, an export train from Turkey went to China, uh, to reaching Xi'an, uh, covering uh, 8,700 kilometers. Uh, the transit time between China and Turkey is now 12 days, and uh, there's a huge potential, as uh, there are uh, approximately 10 trains operating every day between Europe and China. Uh, in that regard, Bree may contribute to Turkey's bridge position. Um, Baku Tbilisi Cars Railroad Road shortened considerably the road uh, between uh, London and, and Beijing. So in the following years, we may see uh, more dynamic railway-based uh, exports and imports between uh, Asia and Europe. Other projects, such as the Çanakkale Strait Bridge, uh, which will be opened probably in 2023, has to be mentioned. High-speed train projects are underway to boost connectivity 
uh, between Turkey's different regions, especially on the east-west corridor, Ankara, Sivas, Ankara, Izmir, and so on. Uh, the high-speed rail is under construction between Kapukule, Turkey-Bulgaria border, to Istanbul, 230 kilometers. It will be operational in 2023. All this to connect uh, in the future, Edirne to Kars by uh, high-speed rail. Uh, Turkish authorities remind regularly that uh, a link between Bri and Middle Corridor is shorter and less costly than any alternative involving North or South uh, corridors. So the discourse is quite welcoming. Ankara expects to become one of the fundamental links in the global supply uh, chains. Um, Ankara is demanding more uh, Chinese investments in Turkish transportation, energy and mining infrastructure. You probably heard reports about an eventual Chinese contribution to Canal Istanbul project, uh, even though there are also a few setbacks, such as the deal concerning the purchase of 51% of the shares of the third Bosphorus Bridge. As a footnote, uh, subway vehicles that will connect the city center to Istanbul airports are Chinese made. Trial operations have already begun in our city's newest subway line. Um, we can add to that picture uh, seaports uh, as well. The construction of oil or natural gas pipelines may be a key area of investment and cooperation. Uh, we already have increasing Chinese financial investments uh, to realize some energy and mining projects. Um, Ankara also hopes to see a flow of Chinese financial assets to Turkey, not always possible without uh, offering lucrative tenders uh, to Beijing. Nevertheless, after having said all this, uh, we mustn't turn a blind eye to the empty half of the uh, glass. It is difficult to forget uh, the trends in international politics. The nature of the relationship between the USA and the People's Republic of China will, of course, have an impact on all this, uh, especially in a time when the US is stepping up pressure on all countries to pick their side uh, concerning their relations with China, but also with uh, Russia. The Summit for Democracy called by President Biden, uh, which is starting today, is a good demonstration of it. Turkey, along with Hungary, uh, is the only NATO country which is not invited. I don't have time to get into details, but let's just say that coincidentally, uh, Hungary uh, has a quite warm relationship with uh, China. Uh, the NATO 2030 plan is quite clear. Uh, China is described officially as a serious challenge uh, by the military alliance we belong to. The EU also described China as a systemic rival. So uh, there is a limit to navigate between uh, competing strategic uh, positions. Uh, and the nature of the relationship between the West and China will also have an impact on Turkey, of course. So the political climate, the international and national political uh, climate will have an impact on the Bree project mm -hmm. and Turkey's role in it. Uh, the last uh, sentence. On the national level, uh, we mustn't also forget uh, the negative perception uh, about China uh, in Turkey uh, because of many sensitive issues, including, of course, the Uyghur uh, question. Certainly, certainly. Thank you very much, Tolga. And just one point I would like to add. You mentioned uh, the Chinese making a point about, you know, uh, Turkey as a transit uh, country connecting China with the uh, European markets. Um, it's for Turkey, I think it's not only about the uh, geographical proximity to, to the European markets, uh, but also uh, the fact that there's a customs union agreement between Turkey and Europe. In the 80s and 90s, a lot of Japanese and Korean companies came uh, to invest in Turkey, especially in the automotive industry. And the main motivation was that they could produce here and export their products to Europe uh, tariff free. Uh, so, and of course, that's another issue. The need for revising the Turkish European Customs Union is a definite must, if you ask me, uh, but that's not our topic. So, stay uh, on our topic and let's have a look at uh, these new projects. And I'm moving to Angela. Angela, uh, so we're now hearing this year we heard a lot uh, about the global gateway and build back better world B3W. And of course, they are very new, so they are yet to materialize. But uh, 
at the moment, uh, do you think that they can provide credible and sustainable alternatives for the belt and road, which has been in action for some time now, especially in the global south, where the need for infrastructure is the uh, biggest and most urgent? And you know, what kind of opportunities and challenges uh, do you see in this respect? Thank you so much uh, for this and also the invitation uh, to participate here. So I think, uh, yes, in overall Global Gateway and B3W can be very credible and sustainable alternatives to BRI. Um, I will focus a little bit more on Global Gateway uh, from my European perspective. So in particular, Global Gateway um, uh, has set out very clear goals uh, that can be summarized with von der Leyen slogans of investing intelligently and creating connections, not dependencies. So it is about investing in sustainable projects, as uh, uh, you said also at the beginning, in green projects, in health, in climate uh, protection, um, digitalization, transport, education and research. So these are all good and ambitious goals. And I also believe that the EU deserves, um, deserves such an alternative to BRI. It also does justice to the role of the EU in the world. Um, so Global Gateway and also B3W can open up alternative perspectives for third countries, especially in the Global South through offers of cooperation for development of sustainable infrastructure. The issues that some of the BRI's recipient countries, including in Europe, have come to deal with, such as the so-called uh, debt trap, um, the standards and, and environmental issues, will uh, likely not be issues when cooperating with the EU, because high standards are part of the EU's, EU's DNA which of course in turn has also been the reason for many countries to turn to China because accessing money short term from China has been easier. But um, I believe the EU's high standards and hopefully also the B3W's high standards um, are in my view more attractive in the long run. And the more issues that countries have with BRI investment, the more attractive other connectivity schemes will appear. So let me mention um, three uh, challenges that I see uh, for Global Gateway in particular. Firstly, uh, the implementation. So we are at the early stage now where the commission has announced Global Gateway, but it's now in particular up to the member states to deliver. So how is it going to be uh, implemented? And even more importantly, how is it going to be financed? Um, it should not be a scheme where member states just rebrand existing pots of money um, and allocate it then to Global Gateway. And I also see a danger that a uh, long time nothing concrete will happen, mm -hmm. such as it happened uh, with the connectivity strategy to Asia, which was announced in 2018. Um, the second uh, challenge or yeah, challenge or issue is that I also think we should not fixate on the on providing an alternative to BRI. Yes, it is a response to BRI, but after all, our European commitment to connectivity is much older um, than China's BRI. So Global Gateway or B3W should stand on their own because the problems that we want to solve with connectivity and um, this sustainable infrastructure are not identical to the problems that China is addressing with BRI. So where can we bring something new into the discussion? I think it's important to think further, and this is also kind of in line with the basic idea of the new European Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, and then the final and third challenge in my view is that we need to coordinate these initiatives in the right manner. Firstly, of course, within the EU, among the member states and with the Commission, but then also with our international partners. So Global Gateway and B3W need to be coordinated so that possible activities make sense and are not being duplicated or even worse, 
appear as competing initiatives. Um, so we had just that experience with um, the US, Australia and Britain announcing AUKUS, which um, uh, was not well communicated and not at all coordinated. So I think we should avoid um, that our, our these, these different kind of initiatives um, compete with each other in some way. And I will stop here for now. Thank you. Angela, thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, very important points. And when you said that uh, EU's high standards will be at more attractive, you know, EU's high standards uh, when offering the Global Gateway SN uh, Connectivity Initiative, I think that's a very important, uh, you know, uh, point here, which uh, will uh, take me to Ambassador Vlahutin. Uh, dear Ambassador, now, we're talking about standards, uh, EU standards, and uh, of course, over the last 10 years, there have been also criticism about the Chinese standards when implementing uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. So could you compare for us the Global Gateway as a new initiative uh, and the BRI in terms of the standards, uh, scope, their contribution to sustainable development? So basically my question is, what is it, what exactly is it that the Global Gateway is promising the world uh, that the BRI doesn't really do so far? Thank you very much uh, for having me. And hello, actually, from Berlin, where I'm attending another conference and I'm, uh, I have uh, walked out to, uh, to, to be with you uh, and very happy uh, and uh, appreciate your, your invitation. Uh, let me just uh, maybe follow up on what a colleague who just spoke uh, before me said. Um, you know, European Union has been doing connectivity forever. European Union is a result of connectivity. And, and in that sense, uh, this is something that maybe we have the most, if you wish, sophisticated knowledge in the world, how to overcome differences, how to create... Um, interoperabilities that are to the benefit of everyone. Uh, and European Union's work on connectivity does not come with Global Gateway. Global Gateway is addressing certain challenges, especially in the post-COVID recovery that need to be addressed uh, in terms of the scale uh, and the speed of the investment in, in infrastructure and a historical opportunity, if you wish, for the twin digital and green transition in, the, in uh, developing countries, which can really push not one, but two generations of, of development and, and make it possible for them to, to catch up. Um, the global, global gateway or the European connectivity approach is based on two fundamental values. The one is sustainability, and the second one is level playing field. Sustainability, be it uh, environmental sustainability, be it social sustainability, that the work we do creates quality jobs, that it really improves the life of the societies where these, uh, these investments are done, that it takes care of the human rights, labor rights, uh, gender inequality, et cetera. Uh, fiscal sustainability, so that we make sure that the life cycle of a project really is a value uh, in itself so that the countries don't go into, into debt that they cannot uh, refinance uh, and absolutely to take care of those countries not only being given a new infrastructure that will hopefully help create growth but also raise the, 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 their uh, resilience if you wish and their competitiveness. And in that sense, I can tell you uh, that wherever we go and whoever we have uh, uh, been speaking to in different regions of the world, uh, there has been a very vocal request for uh, much, more, um, much more scaled uh, and focused uh, approach of European Union, an offer of European Union when it comes to the investment in critical infrastructure. The overall global needs are massive. Uh, we are talking about 2.5 trillion a year. Uh, and that is also, uh, first, it's an amount of money that nobody can give a loan. And it's, a, and it's amount of money that cannot come from public financing. So one of our first jobs is to really 
attract private capital to come in and work with us investing in infrastructure. This will only come within the regulatory frameworks that are either known or uh, favorable to private investments. And this is where I think the, the European approach will really uh, and is making um, a key difference in a way. Uh, and the normative, uh, the normative context within which uh, businesses will be able to compete that brings the level playing field is something that can attract much more of the private, of the private capital. Romana, thank you very much. As you said, I mean, uh, the global need for infrastructure finance, the global need to close the uh, infrastructure gaps in the world is, uh, you know, uh, very huge and very urgent, actually. So, yeah. therefore, I think the question of whether different uh, connectivity initiatives can be, just like the question that we have uh, in the title of, uh, in, of our session, compatible or competitive, so this is why this question is very important because uh, you know nobody can do it alone, as you said. So how can we work together actually, you know, to cover our needs as the entire world, and not just one single country? Thank you very much. I'll come back to this, but let's uh, quickly move back to Turkey, and uh, and uh, Tolga uh, actually when we think about uh, you mentioned some projects. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the projects are, you know, yet to materialize. Uh, some of them are in the beginning stages. There are some projects on the paper, but uh, I can see that actually the Belt and Road Initiative is still at uh, a very early uh, stage uh, in Turkey. So, uh, but the question is, if you ask me, the most important benefit that I would expect from Belt and Road Initiative is to improve our own uh, infrastructural capabilities within our boundaries. You know, uh, if you talk about Kars Edirne uh, 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 railway, of course it's important as a connector uh, uh, between the China, Chinese market and the European markets. But for me, the more important thing is that goods from Kars can go easier uh, to uh, Edirne. But anyway, uh, it's also about Turkey's integration with its uh, region, economic integration uh, and logistical uh, integration. So do you think that at this stage, uh, does the Belt and Road contribute to Turkey's efforts for integration with the region? And here I'm especially talking about the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, uh, the part of Middle East that is closer to us and, and you know, Eastern Mediterranean in general. So, uh, or, do you think that it can you know, bring some benefits in the long term? Do you think it can be a game changer in this respect or should we keep our expectations low? Thank you. Uh, I will have a rather a political uh, analysis about that. BRI as a game changer, as far as I'm concerned in the Eastern Mediterranean, we have an old game, but maybe with new players, uh, including China. Uh, since the 18th century, which means since the beginning of the Eastern question, we see more or less the same players uh, trying to become influent uh, in the region. Some have used military tools, some uh, political tools, some economic, some uh, all of them. Uh, China was not until very recently uh, a fundamental player in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean, but this may change. China is becoming uh, progressively active in the region uh, by developing its relations with Israel. I can think of uh, Haifa port terminal, uh, which is now operated by uh, Shanghai International uh, Port Group. Uh, there are also railway projects there. Uh, China is in close political contact with uh, Egypt. Uh, there is a plan to upgrade the Alexandria uh, port and so on. We can also mention the uh, uh, expansion of the Suez Canal and the construction of the uh, country's new uh, administrative capital. Um, and one of the most, uh, and this concerns Turkey uh, closely, uh, one of the most important uh, changes in the Middle East uh, geopolitical map is happening at the sea in the entire region of uh, the Mediterranean. Seaport capacities are being expanded. New ports are being constructed, major state-owned uh, ports uh, are being sold. 
all that will have an impact on the region's uh, global trade flows for decades to come. The uh, international competition to rebuild uh, Beirut's port is one key puzzle piece uh, in this larger uh, process that will shape uh, the uh, Levant's uh, maritime uh, commercial architecture and as a consequence, the geoeconomic map of the Middle East. China already plays an important role in uh, trans-Mediterranean uh, commercial uh, maritime routes. Uh, Beijing would like to make the Belt and Road Initiative uh, a dominant uh, organizing principle in the international relations in Eastern Mediterranean as well. So the possibility, for example, uh, that the Lebanese government could opt mm -hmm. uh, for China to reconstruct uh, their port uh, has raised alarm in some capitals, uh, given China's current uh, port presence in Egypt, in Israel, in Greece. Uh, Lebanon is in discussion with four countries about the Beirut port's reconstruction, uh, China, France, Germany, and Turkey. Turkey too is willing to play a role in creating an arc of commercial uh, connectivity from the Maghreb to the wider Black Sea region. Uh, don't forget that uh, Turkey has a 1600 kilometer coastline uh, in the Mediterranean. If we look at other players quickly, uh, China's economic relations are developing with Saudi Arabia. The extensive economic ties with the Saudis uh, don't stop China from investing also in Iran. A 25 year cooperation agreement signed last year ensures China a preferential uh, role in uh, Iran. China is also not ignoring the, the uh, North Africa, the Gulf states, Iraq, sometimes without hesitating to, clear, to take clear cut uh, political positions about ongoing conflicts. We saw that clearly through several uh, Chinese vetoes uh, in uh, the United Nations Security Council on Syria, 10 vetoes in total since 2011. And uh, when the war will come to an end, we can expect China to play a leading role in the country's reconstruction. Like Russia, uh, China is one of the exceptional countries capable of talking to all players in the Middle East or in the Eastern Mediterranean. At the same time, Beijing has friendly relations with Israel and uh, with Iran, with Iran and uh, with Saudi Arabia. The same is true about Cyprus, uh, Turkey, Greece, Egypt, etc. In brief, China's influence is growing in Eastern Mediterranean, uh, like in many regions uh, of the world. Uh, in a time when Turkey wishes to become a regional hub as well, an essential link that connects the east and the west, but also the north uh, to the south. In this sense, uh, BRI may become one of the tools uh, that contribute uh, to Turkey's connection uh, to the region. Still, what a region, it's a complex one. Uh, many obstacles exist concerning the economic and commercial integration of the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. The security equation is very complicated and we may include to this equation those of the Red Sea, the Horn of Africa, the Persian Gulf. Uh, the number of crises uh, is very high uh, inside the countries or between the countries in the region. Uh, in order to boost connectivity or to fully use the economic potential of the region, uh, you just have to deal with uh, a number of issues. War in Syria, political unrest in Lebanon, in Iraq, the Israeli-Palestinian question, the Cyprus issue, regular diplomatic crisis between Turkey and Greece, between Turkey and uh, Egypt. If you look at the wider region, uh, you could add to the picture the ongoing conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, the war in Ukraine. Uh, let's not forget the frozen conflicts in the Balkans uh, or in the wider Black Sea region. None of these issues have been resolved definitely, and who knows when these latent uh, conflicts will be reactivated. This is one of the most unstable geopolitical environments. So even though economic connectivity in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, may increase with the uh, PRI, uh, the political implications of China's involvement in this unstable region should not be underestimated as well. Is China's Middle East policy compatible with Turkey's national interests? That remains to be seen. Uh, that's, that's another question. Thank you. Yes, Tolga, thank you. And you mentioned uh, the conflicts in our region. And of course, that also takes us uh, to the question of post-conflict reconstruction. Uh, you know, uh, in Syria, when the post-conflict reconstruction really takes off, it's uh, 
starts in full steam. Uh, of course, there's a debate whether uh, or to what extent China will be involved in the Syrian reconstruction, but we can also connect it to the question of connectivity in the Eastern Mediterranean, because uh, if you ask me, uh, the Turkish ports uh, will play a significant mm -hmm. role, especially the port of Mersin, which is exactly. close to the Syrian uh, border, will play an important role as an entry point, uh, uh, you know, to the, let's say, reconstruction uh, site, and, you know, we'll see how it works. Uh, Okay, back to Global Gateway, Angela, I have a question. You mentioned that, uh, first of all, of course, we need to coordinate initiatives, first of all, within the EU, and uh, then with our international partners, uh, you said. And I think this is very important. So, uh, but let's come to the question of, uh, you know, coordination or compatibility uh, between the Chinese initiative, Belt and Road Initiative, and the Global uh, Gateway. So do you see that they can complement each other? I'm asking this because at the end of the day, we are living in a world of you know, trade wars, escalating great power competition, decoupling, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen saying that I'm quoting, we are good in financing infrastructure, but there's not really much point in connecting a Chinese copper mine with a Chinese uh, port. So uh, what do you think about the possibility of Belt and Road Initiative and Global Gateway uh, complementing uh, each other? Thank you very much. Um, so firstly, I think I would like to say that, of course, there is a match between what China offers and other countries need, um, because there is such a high need for infrastructure development in so many regions in the world. So we should be happy in many ways that China is trying to fill the infrastructure need around the world. And of course, we also profit from some of it. Uh, we heard about uh, port investment. Um, Hamburg port uh, seemed to be in such financial need that they just uh, agreed to a Chinese stake in it. But the actual question that you ask, of course, is can we cooperate with China and merge our initiatives to some degree? And here I would say no. The EU, in fact, has tried this, uh, notably with the EU-China connectivity platform which is not to be confused with the um, uh, connectivity strategy to Asia. Um, this platform exists since 2015, but so far it has been uh, a pure exchange of experiences between China and the EU on infrastructure projects, and it has not yet resulted in any joint ventures. And the reason is, um, I think, that our views on standards are just too far apart. Um, EU norms um, guide uh, our infrastructure investment, and there's a huge gap to Chinese norms. And as I alluded to before, when it comes uh, to labor or environmental standards, we are almost opposite of each other sometimes. Um, and in addition to this, connectivity is also about geopolitical competition, whether we like it or not, as it is about strategic investment and infrastructure. Um, connectivity has become increasingly competitive and geopolitical. So infrastructure is there to facilitate growth, but also attach different regions in the world to the EU economically. This applies to what you have said, digital connectivity, but connectivity also affects the military structures. Mm -hmm. And for China, BRI is definitely a geopolitical tool as well. Um, for example, China is taking advantage of the economic dependencies created by BRI. Um, Chinese efforts to lure European governments with Chinese investments serve not least the goal to divide the EU, not only economically, but also politically. By investing billions in the infrastructures of European countries, Beijing is trying to bind them closely to China and to create a China-friendly Europe. So China is using, for instance, the so-called 17 plus one format as an instrument to exert influence via the prospect of infrastructure investment. So infrastructure has become a thing that is strategic in nature. 
And yes, as we heard uh, during the welcoming remarks, great power, power competition is also part of this. The intensification of tensions between China and the United States, States has made Chinese infrastructure investment more politically sensitive. And in this context, Chinese BRI um, investment has acquired a geopolitical significance that goes beyond just the bilateral EU-China relationship, for instance. So um, Global Gateway is also a response to the geopolitical aspects of connectivity. And if we combine Global Gateway with the EU's um, strategies on the Indo-Pacific, for example, um, the EU just came out with a strategy mid-September, but the member states, France, Germany, and the Netherlands have their own national strategies um, since uh, recent years. And all these initiatives, I believe, can be seen as a response, as an overall response to the question how to deal with China, not only as a partner, but as a systemic rival. And I believe um, uh, that under the new German government, we will see uh, more emphasis on this systemic rival part of our relationship with China. So, as I said, as a, at the very beginning during the first round, I do see great opportunities for Global Gateway and B3W, but I do not see China being part of this. Thank you. Angela, thank you. And actually we should have a full day, you know, an entire webinar or seminar conference about the geopolitical aspects of uh, connectivity. There are, there's really so many things to talk about. Uh, I have seen, for example, the port of Haifa in Israel myself, and that's a very, you know, interesting uh, example. You know, the Chinese investment and an American ally, where a port where the Sixth Fleet is, uh, you know, uh, anchoring. And uh, so this is a very actually this is one of the defining, uh, you know, questions uh, of the future of connectivity uh, in the world. Thank you. And actually, the, I will have a related question uh, for Romana. Now, there are also some European countries which have received significant amounts of uh, Chinese investment, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, for example, of course, everybody knows about the port of Prius, uh, the Greek port. And there are also other projects. Um, I have seen a lot of enthusiasm about the Budapest Belgrade uh, railway project. Uh, we can actually, there are a number of more projects. Can, do you think that Global Gateway can attract countries that are already involved uh, in, to such an extent with the Belt and Road? And if not, do you think this could affect uh, European efforts to produce viable alternatives to the BRI? And this is also related to a question posed by the audience by Jens Bastian, who asked, how do you expect standards of Global Gateway to be adhered to if the EU can't enforce such standards vis-a-vis -vis its own member states like Hungary, Malta, and so on. Uh, so, uh, yes, Ambassador Vlahuti. Thanks a lot. A uh, number of things here. First, I would uh, be a bit more careful about using the word received significant amounts of investments. I would, uh, I would uh, rather maybe use uh, announced significant amounts of investments uh, because you have mentioned uh, two, two projects. Uh, Port of Piraeus happened before the BRI was, uh, was launched um, and the, the railway is not without its problems. We also saw a fallout on the Montenegrin uh, highway, etc. I mean, there were similar uh, situations in, in um, Northern Macedonia uh, and, and, and across the Western Balkans. So I think there are a number of, of, of question marks there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, I started from when I started the job was um, an incredible gap between the facts and the perceptions. Uh, when you do the math and when you look at the numbers, it is quite fascinating to see that within the same uh, cycle of the BRI that coincided with uh, one cycle of MFF for the EU, at a, in, the, in the same period, um, the, the BRI uh, has sort of really invested around maybe 370 um, uh, billion euros 
but through loans. At the same period, European Union, I mean European Union institutions and member states, have provided around 350 billion in grants, in ODA funding. Um, so not only that the amounts are very similar, but the quality of grant money, uh, also in attracting and guaranteeing additional investments, et cetera, is just simply much more, uh, I would say, attractive than the quality of loans, not to mention that these loans sometimes came with, uh, with uh, all kinds of collaterals that also included national sovereignty issues, uh, pieces of land, uh, some uh, key uh, sort of uh, raw materials, etc. So uh, I would be careful, and I think it is really important to, to, to see things as they are, not to mention when we go into the discussion on the on the FDIs, then the, the gap is even even larger. Um, the problem with with European Union and the perception uh, was that European Union is doing millions of things under millions of names. So it was a part of the problem of of, of visibility and really putting this under one, if you wish, umbrella brand, which will then reflect the real scale and the real scope of what European Union is, is doing. Um, I think China quite intelligently did that with uh, Belt and Road. So many things are under Belt and Road, not only infrastructure, and uh, this brand became recognizable. Um, but uh, it, is, it is important to see, uh, to see this difference. And then, especially when we go into 16 plus one, uh, you cannot compare what member states uh, are getting through uh, European regional funds uh, and what uh, might have come through some of the infrastructure um, uh, projects uh, from, from the Chinese side. So I think it's simply just not comparable. The differences are such uh, that, that you cannot uh, go into that. At one point, um, uh, I think there was uh, a very uh, interesting uh, political ambition on, on, on the Chinese side with creating this 16 plus one. I think part of it has been already explained. But there has been um, a lot of um, a lot of understanding of what the real uh, possibilities of, of this are, and I think you can see that many of the member states that are part of the 16 plus one also have been staunch supporters of what we are doing uh, under the global gateway. And in general, I have to tell you that in my work, I have constantly received support of all member states. It is something that has been understood from everyone as a strategic tool, a strategic tool that European Union needs and wants to have, uh, and therefore has full endorsement for all, all European member states. Um, it is something that also, I think, became a bit more clear in terms of consequences after the uh, or through the pandemic, when we realized that um, this is also about um, the, 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 the way uh, the trade routes are created, the way value chains are created, and what repercussions this has for our own resilience, what repercussion this has for our own competitiveness. And I think at this point, there is full understanding that we want to pool our, uh, our strengths, our forces, our financing, which is plenty. Uh, and we want to do this in a more focused and more strategic way, uh, looking at the needs of, uh, of our partner countries uh, and the investments that would really bring high impact and, and bring real change in, in terms of their um, economic and societal development. And um, norms and, and standards were mentioned and how can we impose these uh, outside of the EU if we are not able to impose them uh, in the EU. I would not fully put it that black and white. Uh, I think that the body of European norms and standards is so massive. And I think there is a general agreement in the world that uh, we might be you know, global leaders when it comes to the regulatory uh, uh, logical things. Just think about you know, who was the first one to really push 
for the for the for the green transition, also through norms and standards, uh, uh, GDPR, and you know human-centric uh, approach to digital and in, digital investments, etc. So, um, uh, I I think there is a um, also appreciation from the recipient countries that by implementing European norms and standards, they themselves become more competitive. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, story uh, that, you know, Japan, who, who is our first strategic partner, or we started with Japan uh, in, in terms of connectivity partnerships, uh, I think they were trying to uh, work with, uh, with China in Thailand, and they were uh, working on a railway uh, project, and they could not agree which standards would apply. Because in the railway, uh, you know, the standards are, are rather different. In the end, uh, the solution were European standards. Uh, and I think these are things which uh, we should not take for granted, are extremely important um, and are uh, important also for our competitiveness on the, on the market. And in that sense, um, I fully agree uh, uh, with, with colleagues who, who said that, you know, implementation is challenging but implementation is challenging because it's so massive and it requires such high level of coordination, labor division, uh, agreement on how do we approach uh, things. So this is where uh, I think within the G7 group, there will be a lot of discussion on that also on the German, German uh, uh, leadership in 2022. Uh, and I think in that sense, this is just the beginning of the discussion on coordination. But many other things are already understood. Uh, there is a clarity of, of goal. And, and I think pretty much the clarity of all the different tools and instruments, how to, how to reach it. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Vlotin. And, uh, you know, having uh, received the insights of our uh, panelists and learned from them, uh, for me, uh, to be honest, it will be very interesting now to follow how the global gateway will develop in the new future and how it will contribute uh, to the you know, post-pandemic uh, uh, recovery of the global economy. So I thank you all. Uh, our time is up and I will stick with uh, German punctuality. Uh, I thank my panelists and uh, I leave the job of wrapping the uh, whole thing up uh, to Fridol. Fridolin, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you. Thank First, you. Uh, in, uh, I would like, before I sum up, um, to thank you. Altai Adli, um, uh, also, um, uh, you have continued um, an excellent discussion. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to all of you. Um, I would like um, not to sum up my own thoughts, but in the end, um, pick up some of the remarks that have been given by the speakers and quasi offer you um, a bouquet of flowers in picking some of the quotes. Um, and I would like to start um, with uh, Korhan um, uh, in the introduction. Um, Korhan, you have mentioned um, China is moving at an unprecedented space, uh, pace. Um, this is definitely uh, remarkable, um, and uh, Turkey will continue um, to see China um, as a cornerstone in its international activities. Um, Wolfgang Niedermark um, in the introduction mentioned uh, the importance of aligning with international partners um, and discussing understanding China and discussing uh, the challenges that China poses to us. In the panel on China in the global economy, um, I would like to, um, to quote Alicia um, with um, uh, a selected decoupling. Um, it will take place as a second best. Um, we don't have a, a, a really ideal option in the conflict that we see arising. Um, Françoise um, was, uh, was clear um, that um, uh, the Chinese economy at the moment um, is uh, characterized by a policy-driven um, slowdown of the economic growth, um, and her prediction is that we will see a continued solid growth 
of the Chinese economy um, in the long run 2030 um, by two to three percent, which would be um, uh, reflecting um, the large size of the Chinese economy. Um, Cherem Erenc uh, mentioned three phases of the development of the cooperation between Turkey and China. Um, uh, the early promises in developing um, uh, Turkish trade to China did not really promise uh, to, to go well, um, but the, the third phase currently um, sees a lot of um, financial cooperation uh, between Turkey and, uh, and China. Um, for Tolga, um, he predicted um, that we will see more rail-based trade logistics between China and Turkey, um, with Turkey being clearly a bridge um, between uh, China um, and, uh, and Europe, um, and a bridge between um, still developing uh, global supply chains. Um, Angela Stanzel mentioned um, that uh, both Global Gateway and uh, Build Back Better World um, can be a new opportunity for the global south in infrastructure development, um, sustainable infrastructure development. And uh, um, one of the quotes uh, from Romana Vlahutin that I really liked, um, that um, the, uh, the cooperation with Europe, uh, the cooperation with Global Gateway um, for partner countries in the global south might enable them to implement higher norms and standards and with this make the countries um, more competitive and more attractive for other investors. Um, finally, I would like to ask, uh, to, I would like to thank um, my friend um, as Romana Vlahutin, um, also visiting Berlin at the moment, uh, Barry Hilmas, um, who was part of uh, bringing BDI and TUSIAD uh, together in this strong partnership, uh, cooperating on China issues. Um, and last not least, um, before closing, I would like um, to give a big thank to the whole team. Um, first of all, uh, to Hale Hatipoglu, um, my colleague um, uh, directing the international department in TUSIAD, um, uh, but also uh, to uh, Tamer Shen, to Patricia Schetelik, Ferdinand Schaff, and last not least, uh, Asli uh, Baskaraglu. Um, you have shouldered most of the workload in organizing today's seminar. And my final thank go to you. Um, and I'm pretty sure that this very fruitful and for me personally also um, very enriching exchange um, on China issues that we have established between TUSIAD and BDI, we will certainly continue. Um, my last thank to all of the participants. I hope we have you with us again um, in uh, future rounds of discussion of China issues um, that we will host from TUSIAD side and BDI. With that, um, I uh, thank you for participating and close today's meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye bye.